Montana or bust. We made it from Seven Springs, which is close to the edge of Ohio, and crossed the Ohio line on I-70 and pulled in at a truck stop, crawled in that old RV trailer and slept for three days. I slept through the shakes, and three days later, the old man and I emerged into a beautiful early April day and headed that old van and trailer to Montana. It was slow moving. The old Ford van had a big six-cylinder engine and was carrying all of our stuff and pulling the trailer. Big Jean kept her moving across Indiana and on to Chicago. The van used a case of oil a day. Thank God for Walmart and lawnmower, lawnmower oil. We went from Chicago to Minneapolis and then across North Dakota. The western edge of North Dakota brought with it a big change in the geography. The sky started getting bluer and closer. By the time we crossed over the Montana line, we'd been on the road for a couple of weeks. We were going about 30 mile an hour faster than a Conestoga wagon. We finally came to a town called Glendive, Montana. There were signs for an old KOA campground and we pulled in and got a site with hookups and sat on top of a mesa for four days. There was no hurry. We were in Montana and had no date to be anywhere. Jean went to work on the truck and I did laundry. Jean fixed the truck and found the 43 gallons of water that mysteriously had disappeared in the 19-foot travel trailer. The water pump didn't work. The third day, we decided to go to town for cocktails and look for some ladies. We got on our best cowboy clothes and drove the old van into the town of Glendive, Montana. There are towns all across the United States that don't care for outsiders. It's a problem if you're a normal person and have the mistaken belief that it, anywhere you go is going to be just like your hometown. Believe me when I tell you it's not your hometown and you have no idea what these people have to do in order to survive. So it is very important to be polite, courteous, and well-mannered until you are asked to have fun. When they accept you, then you can let your hair down and enjoy their hometown. Now normally, because I am a natural-born entertainer, it doesn't take me too long to make people feel at ease with my presence. Glendive, Montana was not one of those places. Those people would have had an attitude problem with Ozzy and Harriet. They didn't even like each other. We were standing in a bar and I turned to Jean and said, Grandfather, I think we better go back to the, back to the wagon yard and drink our own booze. These people don't seem to like our appearance in their town. We left. We got back to the trailer and got out a liter of O'Darby's Irish whiskey. Jim Finnegan had given us two bottles of this shit as going away presents, n uh, no doubt because he couldn't sell it. It was like mainlining maple syrup. Hard liquor and drugs were made by the devil, but it sure was fun through the years. Somebody asked me once, do you believe in the devil? I said, you can't have a tug of war without somebody on the other end of the rope. We settled in for a rainy night on a mesa in Montana. Big Gene and I have always been able to talk. Most of our conversations are so funny that other people just like to sit and watch and listen. It's better than any sitcom I've ever seen. And when we were in our prime drinking days, we were even funnier. There's not one subject matter we haven't discussed from hemorrhoids to hysterectomies or from religion to bar owners. This particular night, we were really experiencing our God-given bachelorhood freedom from any restraints and speech time that only the two of us could ever have conjured up. In our 19-foot RV, we passed the bottle back and forth like two old trolls under a bridge. We spoke of women, sex, divorces, relationships, grandparents, trains, 
and anything else our alcohol-soaked brains could invent. At one point, Big Gene held up the bottle and hollered, Kiss my tits, I'm coming! Kiss my ass, I'm gone! I informed him that was the most poetic thing I'd ever heard him shout. I then asked, where did that come from? Well, he said, my first wife hollered, kiss my ass, I'm gone, when she left me, and my second wife hollered, kiss my tits, I'm coming, every time she came. Later, the old man asked, Mountain John, did you ever sing that song my dear old grandpap taught me when we were plowing out in Lancaster County back in 1823? I laughed and said, nope. He raised his buffalo shaggy head, reared back and sang in a high, mournful voice. Raise your tails now, ponies. Shade my bloodshot eyes. I stopped and I asked, Do you know the rest of it? He said, Nope. After some more booze and some more laughing, he said, Where's my food? I said, Look, old timer, you hired on with this crew as Camp Cookie. I'm the musician. You know, if it ain't got a G-string on it, I can't do anything with it. He said, I'm drunk. You're cooking. He weighed 250. I weighed about 150. I said, the hell with you, I'm cooking. Well, I opened the cabinet door above the stove, and there were several boxes that said macaroni and cheese, and I thought, how hard can this be? I put a pot of water on the stove and dumped in the two bags of stuff and stirred for about 30 seconds. And the old man said, mine's done, I can tell. I poured some out on a plate and set it on Gene's table, and he took off his boots and set them right under the edge of the table and took a few bites, crunched along, and said, Not bad. I poured some, uh, some on a plate, and it wasn't bad, but I didn't remember macaroni and cheese crunchy style. It was fine for two old drunks. Gene set his plate down and reached for the whiskey. His arm hit the plate and the crunchy-style macaroni went right into his boots. He didn't see it, and I didn't say a word. He took a drink, and so did I. He said, where's that Gunsmoke movie we stole off of television? I said, I'll get it. By the time I found it and put it in the VCR, I turned around, and there he was. 250 pounds, hat, boots, 22 pistol and holster tied down naked as a jaybird. Somehow I knew he was going to try and outdraw James Arnez. I also knew there would be some macaroni on the floor once his boots came off. Thank God the gun wasn't loaded. The old man finally sat down on his bunk, looked into the TV as a young blonde woman on a paint pony rode across the screen. Jean said in a very slurred voice, Hold oh, me, little darling. There's gun smoke in my eyes. He slid his feet out of his boots, took off his hat and gun, leaned back on his bunk, and passed out. About that time, I started writing.